Boston Emergency Medical Services is the largest municipal EMS in New England. Their primary mission is emergency medical response, but they are also at the forefront of disaster preparedness. Boston EMS invests in resources such as a large medical, medical ambulance bus and personnel frequently participate in exercises with local, regional, state, and federal partners. This ensures a coordinated response to any emergency. Mayor Walsh and EMS Chief Jim Hooley are committed to the health and safety of Boston residents and visitors. Through community engagement, the department educates residents about safety and life-saving skills. Over 100 years ago, the agency started as a horse and carriage transfer service to assist the multiple campuses of the old Boston City Hospital. By 1977, it was an accredited emergency organization and in 1996 became part of the Boston Public Health Commission. Today, it has grown into one of the premier emergency medical services in the country. Chief Hooley is here with us today. He has over 35 years of experience at Boston EMS and he has served as an EMT, paramedic, shift commander, and superintendent of field operations. Jim will tell us more about Boston EMS and some of the services it provides for you. Chief Hooley, thank you so thank much you. for being here. It's a pleasure to have it's you with us to today. So I, uh, you've been uh, with Boston EMS for over 35 years. Congratulations to you on that. Thank you. Take us along the ride uh, with you during those times that you did, because you must have seen a lot, experienced a lot, heard a lot. Take us along the ride with you. Well, I'll, I'll give you a quick background. So okay. I, I was uh, an EMT who applied to work here back in 1978. I started working here in uh, June. I worked in the uh, BLS ambulance for a couple of years. Okay. And then uh, probably around 1979, I was, uh, well, 1980, I was selected for uh, ALS, advanced training, paramedic training, and I went through a paramedic program, which was about a year-long program here. And then I worked in the field as a paramedic uh, on various shifts. Uh, we went to the mid-90s when I became the shift commander for the evening shift and subsequently uh, you know, in charge of field operations. And then in 2009, uh, you know, I took on the duties of chief of the department. I got to see a transition of years from where we started with the department with maybe, mm -hmm. I believe we had, we had 10 ambulances on mm -hmm. at, at pink, peak times mm -hmm. up to now where we, you know, we're routinely in busy hours where we have 24 ambulances deployed and we're looking to expand that in the coming months. Mm -hmm. So what was that experience like for you inside the ride? It was a great experience. It was very mm -hmm. fulfilling. Mm -hmm. uh, it was something that, uh, you know, once I got here, I never really um, toyed much with the idea of going anywhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a lot of responsibility that we put on EMTs and paramedics working in the field here, but when you're the first one, you know, you and your partner are the first one mm -hmm. to the door where someone's grandmother may be having trouble breathing or mm -hmm. a child is choking or, uh, or some other uh, issue that people need assistance with and you know everyone's kind of looking at you mm -hmm. it's uh, it's very fulfilling when you can deliver uh, a good standard of care mm -hmm. uh, maybe try to console uh, folks comfort folks especially if sometimes the situation is not as serious as people fear mm -hmm. so reassuring people is uh, also something that you know that we did uh, over you know and we still do it to this day mm -hmm. it, it was um, it was very gratifying to be there uh, for people at their times of need. Yeah. I mean, everyone says, well, I do this because I want to help people. Mm -hmm. And that, well, that's true, but you actually, uh, with the training that you receive and the equipment that you have, you're ac actually able to go out and do that, perform mm -hmm. uh, help actually in certain scenarios. And yes, yes, many situations. For those, we often see um, the, the trucks driving by, speeding by, we move yep. out of the way, some of us don't, but most of us do. What is the main function of EMS? Well, in, uh, for, for Boston, we're a 911 system, so all of our responses are emergencies. Now, not every emergency is created equal. There are some that are higher priority, uh, uh, priority ones, twos, threes, and without getting too much into the specifics of that, mm -hmm. But there's different call types, obviously somebody choking, somebody you know not breathing, somebody who we think is in cardiac arrest, uh, 
uh, certain traumas, you know, require, you know, immediate dispatch, uh, short response time, uh, good, quick, efficient treatment on the scene, and then transport to a, an appropriate uh, facility. Uh, we're uh, a busy system in that, you know, averaging right now about 340, 350 clinical, you know, calls a day, get dispatched, 24-hour system here, and that's results in about, you know, about 240 that can be of those. Overwhelming, huh? It's <laughs> it can be busy, and excuse me, it's and it can be a little bit of a a, a management uh, a challenge. Mm -hmm. But we do that by having up at so when you let me take it to the beginning then. So if you call 911 because it's an emergency in your home or you've seen something happen on the street, uh, the calls in Boston are directed to Boston Police Headquarters. That's where the 911 center is. Mm -hmm. If you say that you need an ambulance, the 911 call taker keeps you on the line and transfers you over to one of our call takers. All of our call takers who are up in Boston Police Headquarters as well are certified EMTs. They're EMTs who go to the exact same academy training that all of mm -hmm. our personnel in the field have. And then they get additional training on how to handle callers uh, to provide pre-arrival instructions once, and then appropriately uh, uh, type code, put the call in. Okay. For example, if it's a if it's an injury that may require police and fire assistance, or just police, or just fire, or is it something that mm -hmm. you know it, it only needs EMS? They make those decisions right then and there. So again, so we can try to get efficient response with the idea of getting the right unit to the right call in the right amount of time. Is there any particular order of operation when you're actually assisting someone? So. There's two, maybe possibly three, with the third person yep, in yep. training. Um, is there one person that is de designated to do a specific thing first, or how does that work? Yeah, no, not, not, not really. Uh, both members are equally trained, so okay. they're both trained at the same level. And what we do is, you know, one person will be assigned the duties of operating or driving uh -huh. the vehicle. But once you get there, this, this role of the driver, you might you get out on your side and so you might grab some equipment that's mm -hmm. there and uh, uh, the EMT or the paramedic who's riding in the cab with you will grab equipment and bring mm -hmm. it in as well. Now some crews, one person will typically stay in the back with you and once they've assessed you, treated you and packaged you for transport, mm -hmm. uh, you could switch off on calls or you could stay the same way for the night. So the, the responsibilities are the same okay. but uh, you divide it up. What is the difference between uh, EMT and a paramedic? Sure. Uh, all of our EMTs are, are state certified and are nationally registered uh, uh, emergency medical technicians. They all receive, uh, uh, pretty, well, it's called basic, but it, it's beyond that. It, okay. it, it is comprehensive. Uh, they get uh, several months of training in a program where they have to learn a lot of uh, you know, basic anatomy and physiology. They have to learn all the state treatment protocols. Uh, they have to practice with equipment uh, that's that's required to be carried in the ambulances. How to do loads, lifts, carries. How to write reports, and uh, they are then uh, put out in a in a basic life support unit or a BLS truck. Uh, the difference between them and the paramedics are paramedics get an additional level of training, which typically is about a year's worth of additional training. It's it's several hundred hours more, a bit more uh, a bit more in depth. Uh, mm -hmm. Anatomy, physiology, uh, 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 pharmacology—how certain drugs work. Because you're allowed, paramedics are allowed to administer uh, medications. Uh, they can do some advanced airway procedures like intubation, or uh, if need be, a, a needle cricothyrotomy mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. someone's neck. Mm -hmm. uh, needle decompression. They do. They uh, also learn how to do a 12 lead EKG. Uh, uh, interpretation. So there's a lot more training on the front end. Uh, for that, and then obviously more equipment that we have to issue with them as well. And they, they would be going to uh, maybe some of the more, those higher priority calls that we uh, identify mm -hmm, that, mm -hmm. that need advanced life support. Mm -hmm. So there's two different tiers of yep. uh, response. Yep. One is basic life support, and the and other advanced, one is, is, advanced the, life support. is the paramedics the one that would be the more advanced uh, life support? Yes, or? yes. Okay. And, and we, we typically, on the more serious cases where we believe you require that high level of care, we okay. send both units. We send okay. the ALS and the BLS because, uh, as you pointed out, we may need two people in back with you. 
we may need to keep both medicine back or an EMT and our paramedic in the back. Uh, maybe there's more than one patient we have to uh, split up, say if it was a serious accident where both patients require advanced care. But uh, uh, I'll give you an example, say on a, uh, on a cardiac disorder mm -hmm. where a patient may be having a bit of pain, their vitals a little bit unstable, it's, it's not uncommon. We, we would commit both ambulances to take care of you. Things have changed since you uh, started at oh, yeah. Boston EMS. Um, mm -hmm. How you medically assist people mm -hmm. and technology. How have you adjusted to uh, you know the, the change? Well, I mean, there's been so many over 35 yeah, years, I but uh, but I would start <laughs> with even some some simple ones. Back you know when I started, yes, the ambulances had were had radios, but mm -hmm. the crews didn't. And then at one point one crew member would have a portable radio and then oh my goodness we finally got one for both of you one that it's a good safety um, feature but it often meant back in the back in the days when we started uh, if you received a 911 call you could dispatch once you got out of the ambulance you mm -hmm. couldn't get any further updates you couldn't call for help you couldn't cancel the police you couldn't ask for somebody uh, ask for a call back you had to go back down to the ambulance or maybe uh, ask somebody if you could mm -hmm. use their telephone inside a building because that was in the days before cell phones right, or what have yeah, you. Yeah. Uh, so besides some of those advances and obviously advances in computers that help mm -hmm. speed up dispatch mm -hmm. and uh, call taking, uh, a lot more medical devices that you know we take for granted now, uh, your ability to check somebody's blood sugar in the field. Mm -hmm. You know that was that was something before you had to bring somebody to the hospital to get that right, tested on. Right. Our ability to uh, uh, test the, uh, uh, measure the concentration of oxygen uh, in, in your blood by simply putting a finger probe on you. Or the, the, there's a lot of uh, 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 testing that we can do now in the field to help, conf help, help get us a better sense of how well you're either breathing or oxygenating or not. Uh, the EKGs are, are diagnostic. We can, uh, by looking at it, we can make a determination if you are in fact, if this chest pain here is suspicious but your EKG looks okay mm -hmm. or you might say hey you're exhibiting a pattern of a, a myocardial infarction and uh, we're going to treat you for that we're going to treat you for your pain but we're also going to direct you to a cardiac center and notify them that uh, this is the case and they can get the cath catheterization lab assembled and ready to receive you mm -hmm. uh, so the, the idea of being able to uh, rapidly uh, intervene with patients has improved a lot with mm -hmm. um, technology. Uh, you know, a lot of those tools are put to use for that. Mm -hmm. And then we, you know, the, the ability to carry uh, a lot of life-saving medications. Mm -hmm. When I started here in 1978, the only wow. people who could administer Narcan, and Narcan's on the news these days, you know, narcotics overdoses, was uh, in hospitals once you got somebody there and then they added it to paramedics could do it in the field. But it was only paramedics who had that high level of certification. Okay. Back in 2006, our, our department sought permission through the state, which regulates ambulances, saying that, hey, it's, uh, we want to demonstrate that BLS providers, who often get there first, because there's more BLS ambulances than ALS, mm -hmm. can safely administer a knock hand. We can give it through somebody's nose. and. Uh, treat overdoses and uh, we proved that that became the standard for the state and subsequently that became the standard for our first responders and th there's been a great value for that. Uh, patients that we encounter with narcotic related illnesses whether they're acutely overdosing or just somewhat affected or maybe even withdrawing has really been going up over the last several years and you know and that's that's published that's in the state that's that's in this whole northeast region unfortunately. Uh, one, we've, uh, again, ten, almost 10 years ago now, is when we began uh, making it easier for our personnel to administer knock-in. Uh, second, uh, we've, we also now, the city of Boston, uh, police and fire uh, also carry it as well. But, but for us, it's for us to know that uh, the people suffering from addictions and who have uh, prone to abuse narcotics, uh, we we know that we see them everywhere. It's yeah. Uh, yeah I mean it's it's more visible in some streets like you you mentioned because mm -hmm. of uh, people are on the street, but uh, you know we encounter it and uh, you know I live in West Roxbury we get we get a 
we get our narcotic related our overdoses and stuff out there, Hyde Park, East yeah, Boston, it's everywhere. You name it. Right. It's everywhere. So so our personnel know that. We suspect it when we get the call in. Those always go in as a high priority call. There's either okay. uh, unconscious, not breathing, whatever, because it's it's rare someone calls and said, "Hey, I think my friend just did heroin." Uh, most people, you know, we're just going to call for somebody not breathing, or whatever. So you get there quick, and you, uh, you know, fortunately, uh, you can usually pick up the telltale signs. Uh, we begin to uh, breathe for them right away. We mm -hmm. use rescue breathing with uh, while we administer Narcan. Mm -hmm. We also, for the last few years, we've been uh, very closely tracking our patients who right. we treat mm -hmm. and, uh, and the mayor also has uh, access to oh, this yeah, system the as well, right? Oh yeah, the mayor's access to that, uh, mayor's dashboard, uh, we report out our weekly numbers mm -hmm. to his office because that, that has been a priority for Mayor Walsh to try to uh, tackle this problem of, of addictions. Mm -hmm. uh, he's opened an office of, uh, he established an office of recovery which is up at Boston Public Health that we work very closely with. And we'll we'll share information about where we're encountering cases, um, with the idea of they have uh, outreach programs mm -hmm. where they can follow up with uh, do, does the patient, does the friend and family of uh, or the loved one of this person want to receive Narcan training? Uh, would they like to get access to it? Because then now the family becomes the first responder, uh, or, or, right, the, or the loved one they're with. Uh, because they know that, you know, as much as we want to get people into treatment and the goal is to get everybody into recovery and sustain that, uh, it, it, it's, it's one condition that is, to, you know, people relapse a lot. So we want to keep you alive uh, when you, should you relapse again. So we try to get as much uh, uh, support out to them as well. We're right. also, yeah, we, you know, and, and again, a lot of this is to do with uh, information sharing uh, with our partners mm -hmm. in, mm -hmm. uh, in the addiction services. That's great. Mm. That's that's important. It's uh, it's very visible in the streets of Boston. Um, in 2013, mm -hmm. the marathon bombings happened, unfortunately. Yep. But uh, your department proved to be well prepared for that. What changes, if any, did you make um, that you learned from that incident? Well, some of the some of the biggest lessons we learned out of that was the value of training for that type of event. Okay. Uh, you know, back in the 1990s, uh, there, there was uh, there was impetus that came out of, uh, uh, out, of out of the federal government after the, uh, say, the uh, Mara building bombing out mm -hmm. in Oklahoma City. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, some of the other bombings uh, that were going on or around the world was to uh, start to prepare to handle situations like that. Uh, beef up your mass casualty planning, uh, uh, have tourniquets ready in the field. And so that was something that we always had to consider. So then every time we went into a, uh, a special event in Boston, and we have over 500 special events a year of various size, uh, not all in the order of the magnitude of the 4th of July celebration or tall right. ships, right. but we do have those. And, and you do have to be concerned about either it could be a it doesn't have to be a terrorist attack. It could be a transportation accident. It could be something else mm -hmm. where you could get multiple or mass casualties, mm -hmm. if you will. And we've always had uh, that in our playbook. We, we do regular drilling for that. And it isn't like, well, let's practice this. OK, check it off. It's, it's a couple of times a year we work it into some of our uh, in-service training. And we, we saw the value of that so that when, if, if you recall, usually for the marathon, we're dealing with casualties from heat or exercise induced uh, illness, injuries, you know, mm -hmm. because it's an athletic event. Mm -hmm. But when on, you know, the snap of a finger it turned into the mass casualty uh, event because of, of bombings, mm -hmm. uh, our personnel were, were so uh, well trained that they just immediately shifted to that and it was sort of uh, muscle memory for them. So we saw the value of that. Yeah. Uh, we also saw the value of uh, Bystanders, uh, obviously mm -hmm. uh, other first responders, police and fire as well, helping us out, of course. But, you know, in Boston, there's a large medical um, uh, community, a lot of people who work in, uh, in the healthcare industry. Uh, there's a lot of people who maybe had some prior military service with some first aid training. Yeah, they assisted. And they didn't hesitate to jump in. Right. So that's, that's what we try to uh, prepare our folks for because uh, 
not knowing where the next event could happen and or will happen because we, we have to have that mindset. Like, how would we recognize folks who are at a scene who can help us? You know, can you, would you stay with this uh, person who's got this bleeding and say, just reassure her, someone's gonna get to her because, hey, you look like somebody who me who's got it together. Can you watch these two people? I have to go take care of a couple more serious injuries. And, uh, or could you get these folks, walk them out that way? And, you know, some of those simple um, steps like that can be life-saving. Yeah, very, very um, helpful. You know, we, we're also, uh, you know, we're trying to uh, uh, practice regularly with the Boston Police Department. Yes. Uh, where, you know, one of the threats that, you know, where we see around the world is mass casualties from shootings. So how can you respond to that mm -hmm. safely, mm -hmm. uh, you know, close enough to be maybe not danger close, but close enough so that uh, as soon as the police say, hey, we can control this space, even just for a little bit, we have you covered, you can go in and get them, extract them, get them out. Because our goal is to really try to save people who have, who have a chance to right. live. And uh, the more minor trauma we can, we can maybe hold off onto the side and get them out in the second wave. I want to talk about uh, your community initiatives mm -hmm. and how you service the people in Boston. Um, you educate them on some of your programs that you have, the services. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, I think, uh, as, as I talked before, the importance of everyday citizens, residents being first responders mm -hmm. for others. Uh, well, one of the simplest things is we always try to encourage people to learn how to do CPR. And over the years, we did a lot of CPR training. Many years ago, uh, it was required that we had to go, you, we had to, if we taught somebody, it had to be to a certification level, which uh, maybe incurred maybe some fees for books, for uh, cards and registration that would expire in two years, which is okay for health professionals and for mm -hmm. first responders who do it for a living. But, uh, you know, history has shown us that, you know, family members or neighbors, if they, they don't need the certification. Uh, they just need to know basically how to do it, how to recognize cardiac yeah. arrest, start CPR, or also call 911, mm -hmm. get help on the way. Or even just knowing the signs of someone. That's right. If and they're actually choking or if sure. whatever. And, and what we do is uh, we offer, uh, uh, it's uh, in also strangers are very reluctant to do rescue breathing mouth to mouth. Yes. And so. Uh, and you nurses, know, the, right? Yeah, but but the but you know, they, they do it. But what happened was, uh, uh, research showed that uh, the most important thing is that somebody starts pumping, starts doing compressions, mm -hmm. good, hard, effective, rapid compressions, that that's even more important than the breathing. So we've emphasized okay. that training, and you know, we call it uh, CPR anytime, where uh, with, uh, you don't have to be certified, where in maybe about 30 minutes or so, we can run you through, 30 minutes uh, to an hour mm -hmm. with the mannequin, we can train large community groups, and we've done a lot of these community centers, schools, where we teach people how to do basic compressions, activate the 911 system. But we've also done training for people who have AEDs and they want to know how to use those. Uh, and uh, we do uh, awareness uh, training for uh, a lot of the elderly group uh, groups uh, with the, the mayor's office, uh, the elderly commission. They, it's, uh, it's called File of Life, where we try to just go out and speak to uh, groups where maybe uh, there's uh, senior citizens living uh, the importance of uh, having their medications uh, recorded somewhere, uh, mm -hmm. either on a piece of paper or on something we may provide them to put it in, to maybe stick it with a magnet on the refrigerator door. Mm -hmm. Because lots of times if you live home alone and there's nobody with you, we, if you don't have a medical alert bracelet or anything on you, we'll, we may go to look at your refrigerator oh, yeah. to see if you have insulin in there, say. Uh, mm -hmm. but, so if this note is prominently on there, and some simple steps like that to, to help us in an emergency. Of course, of course. And, you know, we because also every second counts, correct? Mm -hmm. We also do uh, training, uh, our community uh, initiatives bureau, we do training around bicycle safety and bike helmets. Okay. We do a lot of focus of that on, on young kids. Uh, and in some cases we provide helmets at low or no cost if kids can't uh, provide them. We, we do that at uh, health fairs a couple of times a year that mm -hmm. we try to mm -hmm. target with mm -hmm. uh, children. We also provide car seat. Uh, inspection, car seat okay. installation. We have uh, certified car seat technicians who mm -hmm. go through a rather lengthy training process and they have to be just like an EMT. They have to have so many per year 
if people would like to find out information about the programs and the services, where can they go? Well, the best way, uh, if anyone's interested, is to go to the website, which is uh, boston.gov slash EMS. And we schedule that. We do it a couple of days uh, uh, per month out at uh, a location we have in mm -hmm. Mattapan. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but we can uh, schedule that also by appointment. Okay. So, uh, so a, lot of, a lot of new parents want to make sure that that nice new car seat they bought okay. is properly installed and, and we'll do that. And sometimes we're even to help out folks who uh, don't have the ability to uh, uh, pay for a car seat as well. That's because excellent. injury prevention is very important. Oh yeah, especially on an infant, a newborn. We routinely report on uh, patients that we encounter mm -hmm. from motor vehicle accidents, from pedestrians mm -hmm. who are pedestrians or who are bicyclists, mm -hmm. uh, whether those folks had helmets or not, we, we share that with the, the city's transportation department. Boston's got has a pretty comprehensive uh, program they call Vision Zero. Uh, yes. I, I, you, you, yes. You've heard of it. Yes. So a lot of our information along with the police department does get fed into that. So a lot of our information you'll see populated on the, mask, on the map. Uh, you know, oh, okay. the, we, we'll, we and we only really report on uh, on incidents where we've encountered a patient, whether you go or not. You know, and the police might have the ones where there were no injuries, and we were we were canceled. But but a lot of that information and, and the severity of some of the patients we take has been used over the years when the city is trying to prioritize maybe uh, where we're going to put a bike lane or mm -hmm. traffic calming measures, or uh, maybe do some enhancement with uh, crosswalk crosswalks. I mean, they take. They have other ways they survey traffic safety, but they do take data that we provide and uh, they use that to help mm -hmm. to inform. You know, similar with, uh, we, you know, we try to map where we encounter asthma to try to see is it environmental things. Are we encountering patients, particularly kids, mm -hmm. with asthma? Are we seeing areas where there could be certain hazards maybe in the area? And we give that to the Environmental Health Office of Public Health because we want to be. Um, uh, more than just a ride to the hospital, we want to maybe uh, uh, we we want to be able to maybe prevent your next trip if we can, or yeah. uh, or lessen the, the amount of times that mm -hmm. you're going to need us. Mm -hmm. What concerns, if any, do you have of your men and women actually responding to some of these calls? Well, obviously, first and foremost is you know their safety. Uh, you know, it's a it, it's a it's a profession that you know does have its dangers, and it's not always because of the threat of violence. Uh, we are, where you're operating, uh, you know, vehicles uh, in, in emergency response. Everyone does get uh, training for that, how to operate that. But uh, you, you have to always be out on the lookout for other drivers out there who may be, be impaired. So, the, the, so there's dangers from that, or uh, simple slip and falls in the winter, or on unlighted or uh, bad stairways. Uh, loads, lifts, carries. Uh, patients, you know, they're not. When we train people in the classroom, it's perfect conditions. You bend your knees and keep your back straight. Right. You're taking somebody out of a, a bathtub who's unconscious and they're 300 pounds. You can't always write yourself. So, I so I worry about uh, routine things like uh, strains, aches, or what have you. Uh, we do worry more about uh, you know potential of, of violence. We worry mm -hmm. about the potential of uh, communicable disease, mm -hmm. if you know people should get you know stuck with a, a dirty needle or exposed. So we try to take a lot of steps to to minimize that. Excellent, Chief Hooley. Such a pleasure. Oh, thank you. Thank you so thank much. You for having me. Thank in. You. If you would like more information about Boston EMS and its services, please visit boston.gov forward slash EMS. And if you have a medical emergency, always call 911. As always, thank you for joining me on this edition of Commissioner's Corner. I'm Najah Mawasi.